The feisty fairy tales of Throne of Eldraine are joining the Magic the Gathering multiverse this fall. Eldraine is a brand new setting with brand new mechanics, creatures, and both new and returning planeswalkers. This new plane is split between the realms of the five castles, one for each color of mana, and the wilds, which are a home to a chaotic elvish fae and dangerous monsters. Each of the five castles is represented as a land which enters the battlefield tapped unless you control the land type associated with its color. As an example, Castle Ardenvale enters the battlefield tapped unless you control the plains. The plains doesn't need to be a basic land, so a shock land such as Sacred Foundry will do the job. Each of these castles is led by a legendary creature and accompanied by an uncommon rarity legendary knight. The High King Kenrith rules over all five castles. Kenrith, the Return King, is the buy box promo card which might not see a lot of standard play, but is an excellent commander card. He has an ability in each color which can be applied to any player in a game, making him a champion of politics decks, where you can tactically help your opponents defeat each other as you build your own power. His wife, Linden, the Steadfast Queen, has some definite synergy going on with all the Ajani's pride mates out there, gaining you one life for each white creature that attacks. Sir Alan, the Lion's Claw, stands by her side by buffing other attacking creatures. Gadwick, the Wizened, draws you cards and taps your opponent's creatures in blue. Sir Eleonora, the Discerning, grows alongside your hand side, giving you some payoff for all that card draw. Ayara, the First of Lock Twain, steals your opponent's life and gives you a sacrifice outlet. Her knight, Sir Conrad the Grim, what a name, deals damage to your opponent when creatures enter or leave the graveyard. Torbron, Thane of Redfell is a dwarf who increases the damage dealt by any red source by two. He seems like an incredible addition to mono red decks, especially ones based around Cavalcade of Calamity, which is particularly hot right now. Sir Kara the Bold lets you play cards exiled off the top of your deck when she, or an instant or sorcery, deal damage to any player, including yourself. So if you want to hurt yourself to exile a card to play the card, do it. The last castle's leader is Yorvo, Lord of Garenbrig. He looks like a great target for proliferate on top of being a beefy creature that embiggens other creatures entering the battlefield under your control. Sir Farron, the Henchhammer, is a bear, riding a bear, that buffs other attacking creatures. There are also legendary artifacts associated with each of those five castles. They all have a variable cost and are typically pretty expensive before their cost is reduced. The Circle of Loyalty benefits knight decks by buffing and creating knight tokens. Its cost is reduced by the number of knights you control. The Magic Mirror draws you cards during your upkeep, and it's an ever-increasing number of cards. And it has its cost reduced by the number of instants and sorceries in your graveyard. This strikes me as a great card to play in Commander. The Cauldron of Eternity decreases in cost based on the number of creature cards in your graveyard, and allows you to resurrect those creatures for a bit of mana and a bit of life. Embercleave is an equipment with Flash that gives plus one, plus one, double strike, and trample, and costs less for each attacking creature you control. It equips itself to a creature when it enters the battlefield. It can even be played after blockers are assigned. The Great Henge is a portal between the five realms and any part of the wilds. It generates mana and life and buffs your creatures and draws you a card any time a non-token creature enters the battlefield under your control. It has its cost reduced by the greatest power among creatures you control, which is an easy thing to increase with cards like Giant Growth and Collision Colossus in Standard. Amazingly, I've managed to get this far into talking about the set without even mentioning the new mechanics. Throne of Eldraine introduces Adamant, Adventure, and Food. Delicious. Creature cards with Adventure can either be cast normally from the hand as creatures, or you can cast the Adventure, which is an instant or sorcery. When the Adventure resolves, the card is put into exile, and you're able to cast the creature side of the card from exile. If the adventure is countered, the card goes to the graveyard, and a creature can't be cast. This means that you get additional value from bouncing a creature back into your hand using Teferi Time Raveler or Unsummon, or Run Away Together. Murderous Rider is one of the most powerful new adventure cards, giving you instant speed removal of creatures and planeswalkers. Realm Cloaked Giant is the set's only board wipe, and it comes attached to a 7-7 giant. Fay of Wishes wishes for cards from your sideboard, and Giant Killer is exactly what it sounds like. Love it when it works. When these cards are in your hand or graveyard, they are creatures, and thus can't be touched by cards like Duress. Some cards take note when you cast a card with Adventure, like Wandermare and Edgewall Innkeeper, one of which gets bigger and the other one draws you cards. 
The second mechanic in Eldraine is a little less groundbreaking, but it rewards one and two color decks by improving your spells when you cast them with three or more of the same color of mana. The effects from Adamant are different on every card, so be sure to consider them carefully when drafting. The third mechanic is food, a new artifact subtype and a new type of token. Food artifacts can be sacrificed for two mana, and they can gain you three life. A lot of cards in a set make food as an ability or allow you to sacrifice the food to an additional effect. These cards are all in green or black. Now let's talk tribes. The creatures of Eldraine don't like to define themselves by creature type, and instead split themselves by knights of the realm and the non-humans of the wild. The knights are centered in red, white, and black, with a two-mana lord in Boros and some tribal synergy between cards. On the other hand, there are cards in red and green that give buffs to non-humans like Grumgully the Generous and Ferocity of the Wilds. By the way, the mushrooms with Grumgully is offering to you... They're not in my mushroom guide, so I'm pretty sure they don't exist. The other color combinations have recurring themes in Throne of Eldraine as well. Like white and blue benefit decks with artifacts and enchantments. Red and blue have a theme of extra abilities when you draw a second card in a turn like with Improbable Alliance. There's also new cards that help you draw two cards in a turn, like Thrill of Possibility, which is an instant speed, tormenting voice. Black and blue reward you for milling your opponents or hitting the threshold of seven or more cards in your opponent's graveyard. Vantress Gargoyle, Drown the Lock, Lockmere Serpent, and others play off of this theme. You might have noticed that very few cards in this set mention Planeswalkers. The set only has three Planeswalker cards and only one new Planeswalker character. The Royal Scions feature Will and Rowan Kenrith, which we previously saw in the Battle Bond set. This three-mana Planeswalker lets you choose between two plus abilities. One of these abilities draws and discards, while the other one buffs creatures. The ultimate ability for these two draws cards, then blasts any target. Because of the high starting loyalty of this card, it doesn't seem too difficult to use the minus eight ability. Grook, Cursed Huntsman, marks the return of a planeswalker hunting hulk of a man. At six mana, he's not easy to cast, but his abilities are powerful. Instead of having an ability that adds loyalty, Grook makes wolves, which add loyalty to him when they die. This makes it difficult to predictably add loyalty to Grook without proliferating, but his ultimate ability only costs six loyalty, and he comes into play with five. Grook's minus six ability gives you a permanent creature buff, which you cannot get rid of. Because we have multiple cards in Standard that benefit wolf creature types, Garruk's Wolves may have a place in a wolf tribal deck. The third Planeswalker card is Oko, Thief of Crowns. This wicked fae has come to Eldraine to make food and turn things into elk, if his card is any indicator. Actually, I read the book, and that's exactly what he does. I see this card getting a lot of potential play in Simic and Sultai decks for his low cost and ability to turn out a 3-3 creature every other turn. His abilities can also be used defensively by turning dangerous artifacts or creatures into 3-3 elk. Throne of Eldraine also gives us the ultimate planeswalker hunting beast. The questing beast. It's fast, it's vigilant, it's deadly, it can't be blocked by small creatures, its damage can't be prevented, and it incentivizes attacking players directly and then dealing damage to a planeswalker because that's its special ability. This gets around cards like Oath of Kaya, which would deter you from attacking a planeswalker directly. I love this card. I seriously love this card. Throne of Eldraine also gives us a ton of variety in cards which are sure to spice up standard gameplay. Fabled Passage is going to be a must-have in many multicolored decks. This card is an upgrade from our normal basic fetch lands like Terramorphic Expanse and Evolving Wilds because the card that comes into play isn't tapped if you have four or more lands. Two of the cards from the common land cycle which come in tapped unless you control three or more lands of the same type also seem very strong. Mystic Sanctuary and Witch's Cottage have abilities that trigger when they come in untapped and they return cards to the top of your library from your graveyard. After a long, long year, Fling is coming back to standard. And we also lose its Sorcery Speed sister, Thud. This card pairs wonderfully with the reprinted blocking combat trick, Righteousness, for a hilariously high damage combo. Artifacts don't get left behind with the Stone Coil Serpent. This impressive creature scales with the mana cast to spent it, and it has Reach, Trample, and Protection from Multicolored. This protects it from Oko, Teferi, and Vraska, and creatures like Gruel Spellbreaker, Feather, or Hydroid Crisis. Sorcerer's Spyglass was about to rotate out, but we got a reprint just in time. This is a great sideboard addition, which I recommend when you're trying to avoid or turn off some troublesome activated abilities. 
You knew we couldn't get through a fairy tale themed set without Prince Charming, right? The Charming Prince is as charming as he is versatile. He's akin to a charm card printed in older Ravnica sets with give you a choice of abilities, so he can be useful in plenty of scenarios. Speaking of versatility, Rankle, Master of Pranks, is a fast flying creature in mono black that has an assortment of abilities which you can choose from to maximize how much you frustrate your opponents. I still haven't figured out to do with one of the other legendary creatures, Emery, Lurker of the Lock, but her abilities seem strong and she seems like she might be a popular commander for artifact decks. Deafening Silence. That's a new nasty card. It locks down the game state and prevents your opponent from pulling off multi-card combos by stopping multiple non-creature cards from being cast in a turn. Iron Crag Feet is a mana accelerator that will let you cast a 6-mana Chandra or a 7-mana Dracoseth on the fourth turn in mono red. Just think about how terrifying that would look to an opponent. If all the elementals from Corset 2020 had been burning you out, Hushbringer shuts down Enter the Battlefield abilities. This card also punishes decks running Cavaliers, Judith, or Dreadhorde Butcher by preventing their death-triggered abilities. Once Upon a Time might see play in multiple formats because of its unique ability to be cast for free if it's the first spell you cast in a game. It helps you search for creatures or lands at instant speed so you can find exactly what you need when you need it. The Seven Dwarves is kind of like Rat Colony, but you can only have seven of them in a deck. Each one you get into play increases the power and toughness of each other card of the same name. I'm a bit disappointed there aren't seven unique card arts for this, so I'll have to make them myself. We're used to seeing cards that copy creatures, but Mirror Maid is a way to clone artifacts and enchantments. This can also copy artifact creatures or permanents your opponent's control. We even get an alternate win condition in a set with Happily Ever After. It's not an easy criteria to hit, but I could see it bringing victory in a prison control deck. There's also a cycle of 10 cards with hybrid mana costs, which could be useful if Devotion returns as a mechanic in the next set, which we know takes place on Theros, the previous home of the Devotion mechanic. Along with the release of Throne of Eldraine are four pre-constructed decks for the Brawl format of Magic. Brawl is a standard singleton format, and in Brawl you have a legendary creature or planeswalker serve as your commander, and every card in the deck needs to fit within the color identity of the commander. In the four pre-constructed Brawl decks are 20 cards which you can't find in packs of Throne of Eldraine. Some of these exclusive cards are sure to be Commander and Brawl staples, like Arcane Signet and Tome of Legends, and the reprint of Command Tower. These cards likely won't see any standard play due to their commander-related abilities, but they're still highly sought after. The commanders themselves are powerful creatures with these decks designed with their abilities in mind. With Chilane, Teller of Tales of the Wild Bounty deck, every creature you cast is a free growth spiral, drawing you a card and allowing you to put a land from your hand onto the battlefield. This pairs with creatures with strong Enter to Battlefield abilities like Thorn Mammoth and Frilled Mystic. The Jun deck, Savage Hunter, features a fearsome king-turned-dragon, Corvold the Fey-Cursed King. This deck revolves around sacrificing permanents and drawing cards when you sacrifice using Corvold's passive. The Esper Fairy Schemes deck is led by Alayla, Artful Provocateur, and makes an airborne army by combining Alayla's passive with useful artifacts and enchantments. The Mardu deck, Knight's Charge, is a knight tribal deck with loads of equipment. Sir Gwyn, Hero of Ashvale, lets you equip to knight creatures for zero mana, which is a great excuse to finally run equipment with ridiculously high equipping costs, like Colossus Hammer. It also includes an enchantment that's sure to benefit aggressive knight decks, called Knight's Charge. The Brawl decks also include the only card in the set with Hexproof, Shimmer Dragon. This awesome dragon allows you to tap your artifacts for card draw on top of having an impressive stat line of a 5-6 flyer. There are a slew of other interesting cards in the Brawl decks like Steelbane Hydra and Fairy Formation, and if you want to get any of these cards in Magic the Gathering Arena, you'll need to spend wild cards to craft them, assuming we don't get them as event prizes. I don't know, they haven't made any announcements about it yet. I did get to mention every card in Throne of Eldraine, so be sure to check out the full set spoilers so you can see the goodies that I skipped. This video was sponsored by Wizards of the Coast and TCGPlayer.com. Thank you both so much for supporting me in making this video. If you're looking for more Magic the Gathering content, you can catch me live almost every day at twitch.tv Amazonian. Thank you for watching.